Hey everyone, this is Mike Shaw with Planet for Photographers. In today's video tutorial, we're going to talk about the Lunar Eclipse feature under the Eclipse tool to get you all set for the upcoming total lunar eclipse on January 20th, 2019. To access the tool, simply swipe down from the ephemeris page chooser like this and select the Eclipses option like this. The Eclipse tool is the third one over under the Special Interest category selected like this. Tap the first button on the page up here and select Lunar Eclipse since that's the one we want to plan. And since we're talking about a total lunar eclipse, we'll filter the list by selecting the total lunar eclipse option like this. So now let's review a brief background on the frequency of eclipses. First of all, while solar and lunar eclipses are both eclipses, they're clearly very different with these differences extending into their frequency. For example, there's generally only around one solar eclipse a year and only a small part of the Earth can actually see the total solar eclipse when it takes place. In fact, for a specific area, you're only going to see a total solar eclipse about once every 300 years. So for most people, it's really a lifetime event. Now, lunar eclipses are much more common. That's because when a lunar eclipse occurs, roughly a third of the area on Earth can see it. This means that there's a reasonably good chance for you to witness a lunar eclipse. Now, lunar eclipses also occur in batches, with some form of a lunar eclipse often taking place two or three, four times a year. For example, if we look here, you can see that from 2003 to 2004, within one and a half years, there were four total lunar eclipses. Then, after two years, from 2007 to 2008, you can see here that there are three occurrences. And the batch continues on, and now there are three lunar eclipses that started back in January 31st in 2018, the last one takes place on January 20th, 2019, which is going to happen later this month. Now, it turns out that people in Asia can see the first two lunar eclipses in this batch, but unfortunately not this one. People in the Americas can see the first and the third one, but we missed the second one. So in some ways, it seems very fair that every area can see two out of the three. So now let's go ahead and select the lunar eclipse of January 20th, 2019, and let's plan it. Now, in the latest version of the app, after you open the Lunar Eclipse tool, you can zoom out like this to see some labeled curves on the map. These curves help us identify whereabouts on Earth you can actually see the lunar eclipse. But before we talk about this in detail, let's just look at how lunar eclipses happen and get familiar with some of the key terms. So we'll start by taking a look at this photo. Let's look at the top part first. Right here is the Sun, here's the Earth, and the Sun shines on the Earth and casts a shadow on its opposite side. This shadow is called the umbra, and it's a cone indicated by the black shade. If you're in space and totally within the cone of the umbra, and then you look at the direction of the sun, you won't be able to see it because the Earth blocks it. This would be a total lunar eclipse. Now, if you're in partially in the cone of the umbra, then you'll see part of the sun because the Earth is blocking only a part of it, and this would be one type of a partial lunar eclipse. Now, around the umbra, there's another type of a shadow, which is called the penumbra, which is a diffuse shadow of the Earth. If you're in space and you're completely within the penumbral area, you'll still experience a partial lunar eclipse. It'll just be less distinct than if you were partially in the umbra. But now you can understand that when the moon passes through either the umbra or the penumbra, a total or partial lunar eclipse will occur. So now, here's another way of looking at this. Let's look over here. If we cut through this area right here, then we'll see something like what's shown in the diagram below. Now here you can see the red circle in the middle corresponds to the, the umbra, and the gray circle around it is the penumbra. And let's say we have the moon moving from left to right across this area. What happens is it cuts through the penumbra first, then it passes through the umbra, then it passes back through the penumbra, and eventually comes out of the Earth's shadow entirely. That's the whole process of a total lunar eclipse. And there are several interesting points or events during this process which we want to understand like this. So we can see that when a large and a small circle touch or contact, there are four possible ways of making contact. The first was they touch externally, which is when the circle of the moon contacts the penumbra circle from the outside, for example. We're going to call this event P1. P stands for penumbra, and the 1 means first contact. Next, there are two penumbral contacts after P1, which are when the moon contacts a penumbral circle internally, one on either side. But since these are less important in this particular case, we're just going to go ahead and ignore those. Finally, there is another external contact, P4. It's the fourth contact of the moon and the penumbral circles over here on the far right, and we do want to take notice of this. Now, there are also four contacts of the moon and the umbra circles. They are U1, which is the first external contact of the moon with the umbra, and this is when the noticeable partial eclipse begins. U2, which is the first internal contact with the umbral shadow, and this is when the total lunar eclipse begins. 
U3, which is the second internal contact of the moon with the umbral shadow. This is when the total lunar eclipse ends. And U4, the second external contact with the umbral shadow and the final contact of the moon with the umbra. After U4, the eclipse is pretty much over. So these events are shown here, along with the point of maximum eclipse, which is when the moon reaches the innermost position of the umbra. So in summary, we've got seven key events that we're interested in. And they are, one, the penumbral eclipse begins, P1. Two, the partial eclipse begins, U1. Three, the total eclipse begins, U2. Four, the point of maximum totality. Five, the total eclipse ends, U3. Six, the partial eclipse ends, U4. And seven, the penumbral eclipse ends, a P4. So just remember these P and U symbols as we'll see them in the app. In fact, let's return to the app now. Now, if you look at the information on the second row of the Eclipse page, you'll understand their, their meanings. This information corresponds to each of the seven events we just described. Notice also that the angles on the bottom represent the elevation angles of the moon at the specific time. All of these depend, of course, where on Earth you're located. Also, when you look at the map, you'll now understand what these symbols mean, as well as the curves. So let's unpin the camera location and place it just to the side of the P1 curve. Note the elevation angle here under when the penumbral eclipse begins. As you can see, it's almost zero. And makes sense. What this actually means is that if you're located at this exact position, just to the left of the P1 green curve, when it's moonrise time, it's also the start of the penumbral eclipse. How good is that? Next, let's say you're at a position somewhere along the U1 curve like this. What this means is that when the moon just rises, the partial eclipse just begins and the elevation angle under the partial eclipse is zero degrees, as you can see right just here. Now, if you're anywhere along the U2 line, so let's go ahead and do that like right about here, it means that when the moon rises now, the total eclipse begins, and so on. So what all of this means is that if we are on U3, or any area to the right of it, we will see the total eclipse, or at least part of it. To confirm this, and for the sake of clarity, let's just see what happens if we move our camera to the left of U3. So let's go ahead and put the camera, I don't know, right just over here. And now what you'll see is that the elevation angle of the greatest eclipse is a negative number, which means that the moon will be below the horizon and you won't be able to see the total eclipse at all. So there'd be no point in, in looking for it. But here are the key conclusions, really. Any area to the right of U3 is good, to the left of U3 is no good for this particular total lunar eclipse. For example, in China, you won't be able to see this total lunar eclipse, but in North America, on the other hand, we will see the total eclipse on this uh, date. Now, with this lunar eclipse as an example, let's place the camera location somewhere in the western U.S. We notice here that the elevation angle is quite high at the total eclipse moment. The elevation angle is shown right just here when the eclipse is at its maximum. This is a very high elevation angle and would be very challenging if you wanted to compose the moon with a foreground. Consequently, you're going to want to find a foreground that is high and get quite close to it, such as a high mountain, a high building in a city, or a high bridge. These are all possible conditions uh, or choices you might want to consider. In our example, we're going to use Half Dome in Yosemite National Park in California. Let's go ahead and find Half Dome here. Now, Half Dome is a very tall mountain. If you long press on the maximum eclipse value, you will set the current time to the time when that occurs, like this. Now, we can also see the moon direction, and this tells us where the moon will be at the maximum eclipse. What we see here is that the moon will be to the east and just a little bit to the south of our camera location, which means you want to set your camera onto the northwest of Half Dome. The moon should then be on top of Half Dome during the moment of total lunar eclipse. Okay, so let's scout around, and you might also know that there's a lake called Mirror Lake around this location. So let's go ahead and set the location, the camera location like this on the edge of Mirror Lake. And now let's take a look at the moon sequence in the sky. Now, to set up this moon sequence visualization, generally speaking, in landscape photography with the lunar eclipse, it's more interesting to start with the partial eclipse phase, going through totality, and continuing on until the second partial phases have ended. However, you might want to capture the eclipse starting from when the penumbral eclipse begins to when the penumbral eclipse ends so that the complete lunar eclipse process can be captured 
which is fine, of course. But just keep in mind, the moon is really only slightly darker during the penumbral eclipse phase, and you can't really tell the difference with your naked eyes, unless you want to take the penumbral eclipse photos as a way to record an astronomy extent, for example. For most landscape photography purposes, the penumbral eclipse isn't very interesting. It takes up a lot of time. So in this example, we're only going to include the moon sequence starting from the partial eclipse phase. Long press it on it like this, and set it as the time lapse sequence starting time. Next, we're going to long press on when the partial eclipse ends, and set that time as the time lapse sequence ending time. Now, we can switch to the previous page, which is a sequence page like this. Switch the sequence to eclipse sequence like this. Now you can see the moon sequence on the map. Now we're going to switch the focal length tool like this. And we're going to now select a wide angle focal length lens like this, 14 millimeters, for example, from this drop down list. So now, if you look at the moon sequence on the map, it's not particularly obvious what's going on. You know the moon sequence is over here. You can see the, the schematic of it. And you know that half dome is over here. But it's pretty difficult to visualize the precise moon sequence position in the sky, especially relative to half dome. So check out this solution. It's one of my favorite features of Planet. Switch over to the virtual viewfinder mode like this. Check that out. Now that's way better, right? Now you can see the relative position of the eclipse sequence and half dome in this simulated view. In fact, the eclipse moon sequence is right on top of half dome, which is perfect. But we do see that the mountain does block the initial part of the sequence. This means you won't be able to capture the complete eclipse sequence from this location right next to Mirror Lake. Well, what do we got to do? We got to move. How about we step back a little and adjust the camera location to right over here? And for the sake of demoing, I should say that I'm just assuming this location works. If you do the real shoot here, you're going to want to verify that you can get into this location safely, either by foot, by snowshoe, or by skis. All right, let's go back to the viewfinder and take a look. Okay, this is better. It's almost there. The very beginning is still blocked, though. What about we adjust a little bit more in this direction, like this? and then switch to the viewfinder again. Now we're good. We can see the complete sequence from the very beginning to the very end. The foreground is the famous mountain half dome. Pretty good, right? You can notice that the moon sequence is a nice curve that curves up. Foreground is also a nice curve of half dome that curves down. What a perfect match. We can also fine tune the focal length so that the moon is a little bigger, say with a 28 millimeter lens like this. Let's pull this down and select that. And bam, that works perfectly in this case. That's how the moon sequence plan works for this upcoming lunar eclipse. So to summarize, by using your knowledge of the eclipse phases and the planning features in Planet, you've been able to determine the precise tripod location, focal length lens, starting and ending times for the total lunar eclipse, and the azimuth and elevation for the, for the camera. Now, there's many ways to shoot the lunar eclipse, for example, with both still images as well as a time lapse. So if you can, maybe bring two cameras, one for the stills and one for the time lapse. And with the time lapse, just say have a 28 millimeter focal length lens for the shot we just set up. Now let's see how easy it is to actually set up the time lapse. We've already got the time lapse tool ready to use. Let's switch to it now like this. Notice that there's a full set of tutorials on how to use the time lapse feature right down here. You just tap on this question mark on the screen and you can see them right here and right here. All right, now note here, uh, back to the time lapse tool, that the second row says, hey, there's a conflict. Well, anytime that happens, here's what's going on. Since we've set four parameters, all with specific values, we just need to allow one of them to be a variable. Here, since we really don't care about the duration or the clip, or the duration of the clip or the clip length, final time lapse, we just long press on the final clip length to make it automatic like this then its value is calculated automatically using the other parameters and the conflict disappears. And this is what we find. We start shooting the time lapse at 7.34 p.m. We go all the way to 10.51 p.m., a total of three hours and 17 minutes, and we're shooting at an interval of 10 seconds. Actually, 10 seconds is a little short, so let's, 30 seconds should be good enough. Let's go ahead and change that to 30 seconds just like this. With that changed, we get a time-lapse video that is 13 seconds in length, with a total of 394 shots. We can tap on this here to see all the details of this time-lapse configuration just to check. 
You can even select how many megabytes per photo your camera uses and then find out how much storage you will need in order to save all the photos. Finally, we can long press on the time lapse starting time and reset the time like this and then tap on this play button to start the simulation. Look at this. As you can see, the moon slowly moving up and then through the total lunar eclipse sequence. That's amazing. Let's see where the moon ends up when the partial eclipse ends. Right here, so the 28 millimeter focal length works just fine. Now after you take these photos, you can create a time lapse video or you can use them to create a moon sequence photo. Since we don't need all the photos for the moon sequence, we'll just skip, you know, over 10 or 20 photos to pick one and merge all the moons in those selected photos into one moon sequence photo. Or perhaps you want to merge all the photos to create a moon trail photo. What's a moon trail? I'll show you here in just a minute. So let's review a few of these possibilities with examples from the last lunar eclipse back on January 31st of 2018. Let's start by taking a look at the plan from that eclipse. Here's a building, and what we want to do is have the moon sequence pass the building by on its right-hand side. Let's take a look at the resulting photos. One of them. It was selected from all the time-lapse photos, just like what was mentioned earlier. Here's the moon at total eclipse. It was perfectly exposed. When this time-lapse was made, manual mode was used, and the exposure settings weren't changed at all during the whole time-lapse. This way we can guarantee the moon exposure is correct when we're at the total eclipse. Now it was clearly overexposed at the penumbral eclipse portion, but that's fine. Here we wanted to have the moon at total eclipse be perfectly ex exposed, as that's the most important. And the nice thing here is to actually use this moon sequence technique to illustrate the brightness change of a lunar eclipse event as the moon passes from outside the penumbra through the penumbra and then into the umbra and, and back on through. Now check out this composite image. This is the moon trail I mentioned earlier. You can rotate your phone to see the photo. It's again, it's overexposed at the beginning, but the reddish portion is where the moon is at the total eclipse. You can even see some star trails right over here. This photo is a single shot using a long telephoto lens. Note the red color. This is why the total lunar eclipse has been described as the blood moon. Although the moon is completely in the Earth's shadow, red light from the sun, which has a long wavelength, reaches the moon's surface by diffracting around the Earth and through the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth and its atmosphere absorbs all the blue light. The only light remaining after it passes through the atmosphere are the orange-red wavelengths, and this causes the red color on the moon. Same reason that sunsets are red even though the sky is blue. This photo is again from a telephoto lens. The moon is positioned exactly at the center of the roof of this beautiful building. This photo is also one of the pre-planned photos. Now, you may wonder if this image is a blended photo or from a single shot, and I can tell you this is a single shot. How could it be possible? It's actually very simple. An illuminated building, just like the one in this photo, has an exposure value or an EV of 1. The eclipse moon at totality has an EV of between 3 to negative 1, depending on how deep the moon is in the Earth's umbra. These two EV values are actually quite close. One photo could therefore capture both at the correct exposure. So we can draw the following conclusions or recommendations for your lunar eclipse, if you want to include the foreground. Now, it would be better to shoot in the city and use a lighted building. You may prefer this to a rural area without lights. Of course, if you can arrange for some low lights to light up the foreground, really anywhere it works. For example, if you have a nice rock or an arch in the American Southwest, which is not that big, but the foreground includes a huge mountain, there's no way to light it up using artificial lights. And you might as well forget it because it'll be very hard to get the exposure correctly set. Because remember, even though the lunar eclipse is very dark, it is still way brighter than the mountains at night. Well, anyway, these are just a few tips and photo inspirations to share with you. That's the end of this video tutorial for planning for the January 20th, 2019 lunar eclipse. Until next time, this is Mike Shaw with Planet for Photographers saying thanks for watching and good luck planning with Planet.